we are in territory that I'm very enthusiastic about, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the irresistible challenges that uh, have been my experience in timber. I should have been focusing on a single product like trusses or I beams or something like that in high volumes, but I couldn't resist when they said that everybody else has said this can't be done. Can you do it? So we've had a bash. The starting point is is uh, the basic curved glue lamp, which is the traditional uh, vision of stru decorative structural timber work. Um, the arches don't have to be symmetrical, as you can see. They don't even need to be standing vertically, like the top left-hand one there at the King's Fund. Um, they do need to thrust at the base, so there's either a tie rod across or buttressing to resist that. But they don't, um, as I said a moment ago, they don't have to be symmetrical. Not all that versatile. As if we move on to other ways of uh, forming curves, the introduction of laminated veneer lumber uh, has given us a much better palette to work on. Top right there is Maggie's Centre at Dundee. And in that case, we've taken three layers of LVL, 21 millimetres thick, and vertically laminated them so the beams can be curved on plan. Um, and then they're profiled on a CNC machine to exactly what the architect would like the shape to be so that we're not constricted by having to obey certain rules of the tightness of a radius and the thickness of a lamination. So in that case, you can see the roof members go all over the place and there's no repetition. There's no opportunity to make several of anything. On the left at the top there, a much simpler version where in that case we've just edge jointed 50 millimeter solid timber and then profiled it to the shape again that the architect was seeking as you can see on the or might be able to see on the right hand side of that picture uh, that building goes alongside a corridor and they've got a flat wall um, where the pedestrians go past and the uh, the ribs are shaped accordingly uh, similar construction is used in the one below it where the members have been cut roughly to profile uh, laminated edge edge to edge and then profiled round to the varying shapes but the, the whole of those structures disappear in use in this case it's a mobile classroom uh, we'd, we'd, we've done several of those with a, a glue lamp base the last one is a 14 meter diameter dome on the London School of Economics, which again is, is done from profiled ribs. And then working in co conjunction with the curved ribs, uh, we've got the curved plywood panels to give the perfect finished wall shape that matches the, the framework behind. Um, laminating for us, we found three layers of six millimeter finished birch was a good uh, basis to, to work away from. It's um, possible to double curve it. The bottom right hand one is the exterior of the classroom we were looking at a moment ago. The sheets have been cut into three 800 by 1200 blanks before we pressed them because there are limits, you start wrinkling around the edges if you try to do too big a sheet in one. But the advantage, um, I'll just hop back a moment, is on that one, you'll see the ribs are quite far apart. And double curving the plywood and laminating it makes it so much stiffer, rather like a car body, where the sheet material in its raw shape is easily bent in all directions. Once you've laminated it together, it makes a very rigid, rigid panel. And you can, we, we couldn't quite move them out to 1.2 meters because the shape of the building meant the plywood had got to be cut back to uh, get a clean edge. So uh, I think they're at about a meter or 1100, something like that, to be in tune with the plywood. So the Birmingham Medical School on the right there is faceted in that each of the plywood panels is only bent in one direction. 
They're only, they're only about 600 wide, and you can't really tell that they're not following the curvature around. Um, bottom left, Peckham Library, we had to press those with a double curvature. Those, those spheres were completely unforgiving in that respect. And then Napier University building at the top um, is a combination of both. Quite a lot of it didn't need the double curvature, but there are a few areas where it's a bit tighter radius. Move on to geodesic domes. These are very popular uh, relative to the other sort, sorts of structure. It's a, a very efficient way of enclosing space. Um, the top left and the bottom right are just 150 diameter roundwood machined round for uniformity of size but pretty well straight out of the forest. The dome uh, at, the, uh, at the top right there was conceived as being the perfect 18 meter diameter hemisphere but they discovered that they'd got to uh, squash it a bit because there's a fire escape corridor down the what is the right hand side of that uh, of that building as we look at it and um, so it's 17 meters by 18 meters um, in the original days of grid shells geodesics i mean symmetry was all important because you wanted to make a lot of things that were identical easily but with today's machinery and computer technology, varying the components is, isn't a problem. The jointing on that one and the bottom right, that, that's Bradford Royal Infirmary. And the bottom right is Kingsdale Academy. That one is 24 metres long by 17 metres wide and it still uses the 150 diameter. Um, the nodes are spheres with a central bolt in the middle of the member uh, so that the uh, timbers can meet the spherical nodes from any direction uh, and it's, it, it's not, a, not, a, not a problem. In fact, it's quite an economic way of proceeding to enclose that much space with so little wood. The bottom left is at a different end of the scale altogether it's in a domestic dwelling where two wings of the building meet. That's a covered circulation area um, in, in, the, in the middle. And that's in laminated oak. It's, quite, it, 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 it's a different order of cost to 150 millimeter diameter logs, as you probably imagine. I've stayed with grid shells because there's such a, a strong market demand for them. Another group here, the top right is the interior of the Napier University job that we were looking at earlier. Those ribs have had to be stiffer because the f front of the building was a big oval window with very little inherent stiffness in the building shape at that stage. So the structure had to be in integrally stiffer than the, the more domed variety. The bottom left hand one was quite interesting because it's uh, for the American Hardwood Export Council and they said please we don't want very much bits of tin to connect everything together can you try and get round it. Well those uh, joints hardly involve any metal at all. We've taken several layers of thin oak and laminated it together to make a sort of cross lamb I suppose um, and uh, used a mortise and tenon joint where we've got a dovetailed mortise in the node and a dovetailed tenon on the end of the rib and they're just pushed together when I said there was very little steel there's a capping plate to keep them in place and we've screwed them down so I'm sorry about that a little bit of metal but um, it's, it's, it's quite a nice way of proceeding. I haven't done a real one, that's just the uh, exhibition stand, but if anybody wants to have a go. And the, the uh, bottom right-hand one there is, I think, probably the only pure 
original geodesic geometry where the, the number of lengths is very limited. I think there are two or three different lengths. And the plates are just flat metal profiled, slightly bent, and the, the timber is slotted. Timber slides onto the node, so there's a lot of repetition of something like 50 by 50 with something like two, three millimeter thick plate joints. Uh, very simple. It's um, in a nursery school to give some private space for some elements of teaching. We come on to Gradshell now. The, now this is, this is moving on to the t sort of territory which is more attractive theory than um, practical for most buildings. The original, or at least as far as my information goes back, it's around about 1970, Borough Happold and some, uh, in conjunction with a German company at Mannheim, made a, a net shell building where the theory was that if you took a net and let it hang, um, it formed a very efficient structure if it was frozen and flipped over. Because with chains or ropes, then the, 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 they automatically took the axial course and there's no bending involved. So flip it and you get the, the, the efficient shape. That, that one is 12 meters span and the ribs are just 27 by 80 millimeters, spanning 12 meters. In fact, the journey around the perimeter is somewhat greater than that, but um, that's the um, support to support. They are trimmed with a, a curved glue lamb trimmer purely for uh, convenience, the mechanics of getting the whole thing together, but those ribs don't take any significant forces. They probably stabilize it a bit, but it was most important that every rib was securely stitched to the supporting beams at the, at the bottom. But even they were f rather more complicated in their original conception. They were a sort of lattice beam with those members you can see as the cords. But we realized that uh, it shouldn't be necessary to make that as hefty as that and it worked perfectly well, as was. Um, the others are paying homage to the principle. They look similar and they're using some of the stiffness. Top right is Savile Garden's entrance canopy, 11 meters by three. It's not really pushing grid shell to its limit, but they're still very small members for a three meter span, even at that. Bottom left was a model bridge, nine and a half meters long, to represent a 95 meter bridge in use. It was sponsored by the developers who put it into the Venice Biennale to start with. And then it went to Taiwan where the site is. And then it finished up in Florida in the developer's head office uh, as, a, as a decoration. I don't think the bridge went ahead in timber uh, but we rather lost track of the logic that went behind it. But it is adopting uh, grid shell principles, although not very honestly. When you tried to stand it on its own feet, it was more like a newborn lamb, very wobbly. And I suspect that's the way it would stay. But we could see ways of getting around it, but they were against the clock. And when we said, please, can we do something, they said, no, you've got to do what we put on the paper and don't argue, we haven't got time to argue. So that's fair enough. The bottom right is um, uh, conceived by some children at, a, at an in, at a infant or very young junior school uh, nearby. That's outside the Royal Festival Hall. And um, on some of the images, you can see the wheel behind it. Um, the, the curved members wrap round and form a seat at the bottom when they go in. It's quite pretty, it didn't serve any practical use, but it was fun to make. Hyperbolic paraboloids. Um, we've only done those two projects. They're both made from thermo wood. I don't know whether you know that material, but it's cooked uh, for, I think, about 11, 14 days, something like that, in steam which drives off the sugars and the resins. 
it has the uh, effect of making it preserved to a degree. It's not perfectly prepared, preserved, but it's much more resistant than it would otherwise be. It doesn't rot easily. And it's um, much more stable. So when it's used externally, it will uh, support the coating rather better because it's not moving around as much as ordinary wood does with the, with the climate. Um, those ribs are 280 deep. The point to point at the high end is 9.7 meters and from side to side the thing is 7.2 meters and in that case they've got the thrust held by those triangulated tubes rather than a tie across but each of those members is straight it's getting a curved effect but not but not curving the wood the other one is an island retreat it cleaves eight on the thames where four three and a half meter squares are back to back with tie rods from the middle of each external wall diagonally across to the next one on the adjacent wall. Three layers of 15 millimeter uh, thermo wood has been um, laminated together to, to make that one work. Um, the architect was so enthusiastic about it that she wouldn't let us decorate it or weatherproof it in any way. And that was 11 years ago. But she's having to reluctantly accept that it's going to have to be waterproofed which is <laughs> but it's done it's done quite well and it's uh, it, it, it's been it's been successful hyperboloid that's that tall one is ten and a half meters high the others on the site are four five and six and a half meters high um, they're roundwood again 100 diameter for the tallest and the smallest is 75 and I think the six and a half meter one is probably still the 100 mil. All straight lines. I don't know what you think but I reckon I can identify a little bit of the gherkin in this. But uh, well these, the, the first of these was built in Russia um, in the late 19th century. It's um, it's, it's well over 100 years old. Lamella roofs are quite popular. Uh, we've, we've, done, we've done a few of them. The uh, top one there is 34 by 28 metres um, in, in 2.4 grids, which means all the ribs are uh, 4.8 metres long, and two of them meet a continuous one at the junction of the squares. Um, that one was in the... Uh, a gap between tower structures for performing a hospital and the, the best way of getting the, those members in was by having things that could be handled. If we'd got massive great members which had got to be lifted over very tall buildings it would have been quite a challenge to build. I included the classic glue lamp portal frames as a reference point in the uh, scheme of things. The biggest one we've done is that salt barn, which is 35 metres by 17 metres high. Um, the smallest one is probably this walkway in laminated oak. Finger jointing can save a lot of money and hassle to achieve buildings which will span similarly. Um, and it's quite an interesting application, the bottom right hand one there. Reciprocal structure using round poles from Lincolnshire wood, both the source and the site. Sculptures, steamed, in the case of the top right. We've done one space frame project. Again, that's 100 millimetre and 80 millimetre diameter roundwood. And the last one is a tensegrity structure where the stiff members are uh, not in bending. They're just pure compression. The, and the ties are configured to uh, triangulate the structure. So you have uh, a much more efficient structural form. That was originally conceived with stiff joints and the ribs were considerably bigger than they are. 
in this uh, finished. It's a showroom for the, the Cutty Sark while it was being refurbished. Have you designed or fabricated anything in extreme temperatures? I mean, higher temperatures like above 60, like in the Sahara Desert or something. And how do you think um, the construction techniques can actually aid or work with the extreme temperatures in those areas? I don't know that we have. Are, are you thinking about environmental temperature or in applications that are artificially elevated? No, environmental temperature. I think we would think about using uh, thermo wood because it's already been cooked a lot, so it's it's amount of movement. I think the the problem is anticipating what's going to happen in the future, um, because if it, even if it's quite gentle, if the thing continues to get smaller, um, and it will until it's down to about six percent moisture content, um, but. Uh, and then you need to get the glues right. Well, t today's glues uh, give us quite a wide range of glues that are tolerant of uh, their, they hold their, uh, their bonding when they're in, in uh, a fire. Um, so the, those would be the two main things. I don't know whether there's an implication of greater risk of insect attack. Not sure, but that's the problem, especially in areas like Nigeria. Um, insect attack kicks in after like the first three, four years or so. There are treatment processes that, that will, will permeate quite a long way through. Um, we, we've used, a, a, an interesting thing would be cross lamb. Now we haven't used cross lamb, uh, well we've used it but not in, in, in this context. But where we made some cross laminated, uh, I think it was I think it was Kurt, um, it was Kurto, which is like plywood. Do you know it? Not really. Um, well, it, it, it's it's a, a sort of forerunner to the uh, cross laminated timber. It's made like plywood, three millimeter thick veneers and sheets up to uh, two point six meters wide and up to nineteen or twenty six meters long. So it's a very good piece, a tool in our toolkit. And we have had that pressure impregnated and then pulled it apart. And the pressure impregnation reaches all of it because the cross veneers uh, act to, normally it goes in well from the end grain, but the cross veneers bring it in from the sides as well. So that gives a, gives a thorough um, uh, penetration. Okay, thank you. Should we give him a round of applause? Thank you, Gordon, very much for that. That was amazing. I mean, the range of stuff you do is spectacular. And uh, we can only take our hats off to this amazing work that you produced. I want to talk very briefly, I've got 12 minutes, and <laughs> don't worry, um, about the architect's perspective. So more in terms of the... You know, what's, what's perhaps some of our thinking? We're all quite different, we're all quite tricky. What are we looking for in solutions? And I'm going to refer to a major collaboration I did with Shigeru Ban, um, as well as my own work. I just wanted to start just at the very, very beginning. Um, this is a project, my first project, as I started my practice in beautiful Ireland on a river. And it was looking at a, putting a boathouse in the river. Um, the first reaction was to look at a lot of the existing buildings around and to try and find a language out of what was existing to, to create a new building. Um, that being a copy of, a, of an existing little stone and slate building. I decided to use timber um, and to actually do a reappraisal of that sort of genre of building but in timber. The idea was to use the structure um, and to use the craftsmen, local craftsmen, to create a very clear hierarchy between the elements of the building. Maybe not an engineer structure, but maybe an architectural structure. So there are certain liberties in terms of how it works. But the key thing is the, the vision of the A-frame and the sitting on its columns and the main beams and taking through and having the, cl the clarity of expression so that by sizing everything very small around it, the timber structure read as a very simple and honest and innocent structure using timber on the outside, inventing as kind of a different type of roofing technique, using boards um, in cedar, which would age very, very quickly, and therefore give a patina to the building and sit it into its site. Um, 
The next project was the project we did for the um, our pavilion in the dome. And this was the community project, dome, zone, whatever. And our take on it was to try and produce a building that was entirely recycled, made out entirely out of recycled materials. That was quite a, a tall order, quite an interesting challenge. And I quickly decided that it was impossible to use all different types of materials, but actually we should go for one. And I wanted to connect in my mind to the children of Britain connecting to this project, um, not so much as helping us design it and tell us what they wanted, but more to do with actually contributing the material. So as we've all been brought up with Blue Peter, uh, we enrolled Blue Peter to do a raise, asked the children of Britain to send in paper, size of postcards, we mashed it up, and we made the elements out of the building out of the paper. So it was using the sort of the technology of the paper, but the involvement of, uh, of people. Out of that, we developed, again, quite a very simple system. A system of columns, they were about 300 millimeters in diameter, 35 sheets of paper, wrapped around a giant loop paper roll, effectively. Um, some of them fireproof, some with different strengths, some with different uh, materials um, to waterproof and this and the other. The building was entirely zero rated in the, uh, in the dome. So this was the basic um, building the system, the two columns, louvers to actually create the curve of the building. And we produced a completely um, not elliptical building with very complex shapes. It was actually held together by a ring beam, which was steel that you can see at the top of the model, but otherwise entirely made out of cardboard with some timber elements within it. With panels, which were fireproof panels, also made out of honeycomb paper with um, elements within it. This was the shape of the building, and that was the, the whole process. And that the idea was that at the end of the process, this is it under construction, um, it was the tallest element was 20 meters tall. The general heights were 10 meters. And at the end, the idea was then to pulp the building again, turn it into a little booklet which contained the model of uh, the kit of the model of the building in the first place. So it, it's just an attitude towards material and giving ourselves the opportunity to have fun and to experiment and to bring in people like Gordon to help us actually realize this whole process, which is kind of an impossibility. The idea is to give children of Britain, in this particular case, the idea that architecture and engineering is about imagination and recycling, obviously, is part of that thing. Um, I've had quite a few um, collaborations with Shigeru Ban, and that's obviously been a very interesting thing. He's now a Pritzker Prize winner. At the beginning, we were fairly equal level. Now he's a superstar and goes on to do the most amazing work, and I take my hat off to him because it's absolutely incredible. But what I thought was particularly interesting, and I raised very quickly, we did a project for Kew Gardens, and this is a, a pavilion which was meant to be a permanent pavilion, also made out of cardboard tubes, um, that we collaborated on, and also was our first, if you like, design spa, <laughs> as in conflict or interest or discussion. And on the left was the original plan, which is the space frame solution in cardboard tubes with a million nodes and this, that and the other. My job was to actually try and get this project built. And I went, well, I've got a really good idea. We're going to rationalize the structure. We're going to use Western thinking. We're going to rationalize the structure and we're going to make trees. Trees in the forest, perfect. Reduce the amount of elements by about two thirds and reduce the cost, but it's just as good. He was absolutely furious. And this is really what I was talking about in terms of um, simplicity through complexity or the other way around, whichever one I said. Because in this particular case, it, this is about the aesthetic and what complexity actually means to different people. And to his mind, the beauty of the complexity of the one on the left far outweighs the rational idea of the trees and this, that, and the other on the one on the right. And for him, the departure between those two was almost was impossible. Sadly, we didn't build a building, but it was quite interesting. But it led on to future collaborations, and I want to talk to you about the most interesting challenge that I've had since I've set up my practice, which was to try and do, try and do a, a second version of the Pompidou Centre, this time in the city of Metz, in the east, northeast of France. Um, government project, international competition. Shigeru had been asked to enter it and asked me to collaborate with him because we have so many arguments about things. 
In this particular one, I might have been an expert on the Pompidou Center because I worked for Richard Rogers for 20 years, who so kind of understood the process and understood very much the idea about public space and this, that, and the other. But I want to actually sh show you how two different architects collaborate on this type of competition and how material at the end of it is fundamental. Um, this, is a com this is an old show site, rather like today's show, massive show on the wrong side of the tracks, by a station, no life, nothing. This is, this is our inspiring site. And we all have these wonderfully inspiring sites, and this one, I think, tops the bill. And it's at the top there, and it was going to be an iconic building is what they were looking for. When we went there, <coughs> we turned up with about eight or 10 people um, compared to everybody else's teams that were about three. We were against Herzog de Mohan, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody was there, foreign office architects. We didn't think we had a hope in hell. Shigeru just lost three competitions in a row. When we went there, we were astounded by the cathedral, which was the most magnificent space. So even more than the engineering or the, uh, the facades of the building, this space was amazing. You walk in and you are literally in heaven and the space was enormous. So this was something that was at the back of our minds. The second thing was Shigeru, who's very rational with his thinking, um, looked at the famous picture of Pompidou, which was done by Vasarelli within the hexagon. Now, in France, the hexagon is actually the symbol of France. And if you put the map of France in it, it touches all the different points. So this is symbolically what's going on with that portrait. Shigeru on his travels had been very, very interested in this Chinese hat with the woven form across it and was actually fascinated by the structural implications of, um, of the big hat and how uh, small members woven together actually created spans. Deep down, although he has always been fairly resistant or reluctant to talk about Japanese architecture, was the idea of the great Japanese house with the big overlapping eaves and in particular then the spaces inside that are contained with facades set back from the outside of the, of the roof. And these were very simple inspirations for what we went on to do. This is the master, rather bleached master plan that we came out with, which talked about looking at the overall terrain, landscaping it with Michel Devine, and drawing people in under the undercroft of the building. There you see the hexagon of the building. You also see two, or maybe you can just about see three tubes. And the basic concept was the brief from the Pompidou Center was to have galleries, all of which were 10 meters wide, all of which were six, six meters high in a void, and all of which, the, each program was like that. And Shigeru added them all up together, created a very long sausage, and then cut them into three, and went, there you go, we've got three long galleries that, we need to, that house the entire brief for the thing. Now all we have to do is cloak it. So we cloaked it with the big hat, and then the idea, in a very, quite a Japanese way, of drawing people into it. And we were drawing them also down, rather like the original Pompidou, which leads you into the building, drawing you under the undercroft to discover um, the facilities, and then the galleries above and these searing Thunderbird tubes. Um, the tubes themselves were related to, viewed like telescopes, towards the cathedral, the station, and other sites to actually absolutely try to link it back. That was the proposition. Whether it was going to work, we weren't too sure, but it would seem like a nice idea at the time. These tubes linking you across the tracks to the rest of, of the city. This was the original. The, 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 the competition design evolved in a period of about three months maximum. Uh, we were working in my London studio. We had Cecil Bauman on the team. Um, and it started off as a kind of um, a loose roof, textile roof, sitting over concrete beams, evolved into a sort of circus tent, and then eventually started creating a form of its own and generating a form, which we found incredibly difficult to model. We were not doing this with computers. We were doing this with real model making and had to send the Japanese assistants off to Soho to get um, nice t-shirts with big stringy vests that we could perhaps stretch into the right position. Qu very difficult to do. We ended up using wire. And the thing emerged slowly into something whereby the roof became also integrated the columns. So that these conical forms 
of the roof, sorry, the roof turned into conical forms which became the columns of the structure. This was the competition section which sees it a bit more clearly um, with the three very simple tubes and then this draped roof over the top. Now, I was very happy to propose all this with Shiguru because I knew that he could solve the roof. I certainly couldn't and luckily uh, this, was the, this is when we got the first model made, um, rapid prototyping, and we realized that maybe it was going to be okay, aesthetically. Um, didn't really quite solve the problem of this. You can see the woven structure within it as the basic concept. As I say, I was quite fortunate to be working with such a brilliant um, collaborator who had a huge engineering bent. And his research with his students around the world looking at woven structures which to this day I don't understand whether it's a grid shell or it's a whatever it is or whichever one it is, but it's spanning over 100 meters in certain directions. Um, these were experiments that he was doing with his students in different places around the world, and it was pushing and pushing this envelope, more, I would say, uh, pragmatically by actually doing and seeing than actually sitting there with a computer and trying to work it out. These were these structures that were then built by students. And I've, I guess this is a plea for a continued research, development, and thinking. And this was our initial model, which you'll see some of Gordon's structures within there somewhere. But it's pretty much the woven hat that we see at the beginning. Now, whether we looked at different versions, some where you're actually literally weaving the timber, or in this one where they're on parallel levels. There is no real geometry to this, in the sense that there is no natural geometry in it. It is actually being bent in all different directions, which means that each different hexagon is a different size, different shape, and this, that, and the other. Um, Arabs were so excited by this, eventually when we actually started, we'd won the competition, we were starting to develop it, decided that they'd like to do it in steel, because, <laughs> because it was really far too difficult to work out. But fortunately, we found Herman, who is the most amazing Swiss engineer on the Swiss-German borders, who, um, with their um, construction companies as well, German uh, manufacturer, took the bull by the horns and Wishiguru invented the system to get this done. The key thing here was how the hell you joint these three layers of timber all coming in different directions at every single opportunity. So each different node was different. So you either make the world's most expensive node that can take things coming in in different directions, or you actually work with the timber. And Herman, who I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of times, who is the most self-effacing, could be a, a basically a Swiss version of Gordon, very calmly came out with the node in a way that I would expect Gordon to have done. The node is basically a hardwood joint made in three different components with a spindle in the middle. Sadly, I think the spindle was metal as well. I think he was a bit upset about that, but he accepted it. And this allowed every geometry, every pin to be located with the same tool with a very, very simple device. So at the bottom of this building, which I'm going to show you some pictures of, and when you marvel at the complexity of the structure like I do, because I don't have a clue how it works, it all really radiates from this thing. Then. And there it is, the, the solution to this building that we're about to look at. That's the overall still um, hexagonal and plan. And that was a little sample piece that we made. And this is the factory, basically glue lamp sections. And you begin to see the pins bringing the elements together. This was the prototype 10 meter section. Um, I have to say they were spectacular. The manufacturing of this is beyond, beyond. Um, there you can see the, the sample, the twisting, the bending, the testing. I think to this day we haven't found anybody to insure us properly for this building, but that's another matter. Um, this was, and th this is a slide from Herman, who, who gave me a load of slides explaining how this worked. It didn't help me at all understand how this worked. But the key thing was that we were using computers to work out the lengths of every single piece that was used and the most economic length of it, every single piece. And it's only through the use of computers in that sense that they could sort out the geometry and actually fabricate the thing and fabricate it reasonably economically. This is the analysis of the size of the different members in different places. And this is some, just some of the components. 
with um, definitely twisting in two or three different directions. And this is the beginning of it. This is the engineer, Franz. <laughs> Very proud of his beam. Now, I look at something like that, and I wouldn't be able to begin to know how to specify that myself. But, um, and this is the beginning of the assembly of these different elements, which I have to say was done unbelievably calmly. Each member was obviously numbered. Each member arrived at the right time. There, there wasn't quite the British malaise that we have where they don't quite all arrive on the same day as you're trying to do it. This is the beginning of the cloaking of that building. And you can see the beginning of the structure, the, the columns beneath, and this draping. And I think it's quite the most beautiful thing I've seen in terms of how it's put together. These are the different layers that are going on. And then the, 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 uh, the tent structure going over it. So it's effectively a great big umbrella over this, uh, these very simple tubes. This is, the this is if, in fact, architect's innocent imagination at the beginning of a project, thinking about how nice it would be just to shape things and to bring them down to the ground. Collaboration with people who actually really know what they're doing and have got experience, and then finding the right people to actually manufacture and develop it and actually bring it into reality. And I have to say that it's the most spectacular effect. Um, the artists use it, have projected I don't know how, over the whole screen. So you have this incredible honeycomb effect on the inside during the day and on the outside at night. I mean, and in a way, the cathedral type structures of, of flying buttresses and vaults and what have you, with these very simple rational elements coming through, which is the galleries. So the space, the public spaces are kind of amongst all this, with these soaring spaces. And this is a view from one of the tubes. Now, the tubes work better than we ever dreamt because they're basically like telescopes. If the, the further away you stand from the window, it's about 100 meters long, by the time you're 80 meters away from the window, the, uh, the cathedral fills the entire window. That famous trick that we all look at, the moon being suddenly enormous at times. So you get the real presence of the city within the building. And we tried very much this expressive use of the structure. So going from that very flat beginning to a very expressive forms. And that's it at night, realistic view. Thank you very much. A slightly different scale building, uh, a, a, different, a different budget. Uh, this is Alfredson Swimming Pool. Um, finished uh, just under a year ago for a state school out in Buckinghamshire. So we, on this project, we're actually working with Cowley Timber. And it was about driving efficiencies through repeated modules, uh, delivering a space for a, um, a special education needs school where there's kind of high levels of, levels of autism, about delivering a space that was calm, uh, collected, also dealing with uh, acoustics um, to the sensitivity of um, different children to the, the reverberation that you get within a normal swimming pool. Um, and I've got a lot of slides here. Um, kind of flicking through, it's kind of the narrative through from the inception to construction and, uh, and, and tell me where I get to and we can flick to the end to some other images if, if needs be. Um, but So this project was conceived over seven years ago uh, when we were a very small office, we're now about 50, office, 50 uh, people, sorry, I'm from Doug and Morris, so I didn't sort of make that clear. Uh, this is the site out in Buckinghamshire, um, right on the edge of the green belt there, so this is the green belt sweeping around, um, highly... Um, uh, tricky site. Um, this is the um, highlighted on the right. It's the old gym building uh, with the old swimming pool. Uh, this was their swimming pool at the time, condemned and unsafe to use. The, the school is actually now um, an academy, a sports academy. So the kind of uh, we were brought on board to master plan uh, the gym area, the swimming pool, and kind of adding to their facilities. Um, for us, uh, we kind of respond through. Um, context, the kind of, this collection of articulated roofs on the site became a point of interest and how we'd engage with those and also how we'd make a building that could sit within its context on the edge of the green belt. So we started off, we built a lot of models. So uh, very early on we worked with um, Elliot Wood, engineers, and it, it was very sort of simple conception that the, you need to span the, the pool on the short dimension building up a number of repeated elements that could span the 15 meters and then repeat as they need uh, across the, uh, the whole length of the swimming pool. So this is very simply kind of taking the articulated roof and then we wanted to create 
uh, a more of a sculptural form. We looked at introducing uh, distortions into those roofs um, and eventually getting to pretty much what the final concept was, which was a floating timber box, articulated roofs, set on this one meter margin so it floats just above the pool. So as you swim, you get this vista out into the green belt. So there's the concept model. Um, again, you can see this kind of, this idea of this floating box. So it's this rigidly folded box created by a repetition of, 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 of segments, lifted up on small pilotti, one meter high, 120 steel uh, feet. Kind of, and then on the outside, the building was also conceived timber on the, uh, on the inside and to be on the outside. So this was a reference back to the agricultural vernacular of the open jointed timber. Um, and for this, we used a, a Plato thermo wood, which I think uh, Gordon touched on earlier. But in terms of leaving it exposed to weather to a gray, again, linking it back to the uh, agricultural narrative and back into the greenbelt. So this is the internal concept. So we talked about this repetition. Uh, there was some idea, um, the narrative, this idea of this floating structural timber box linking back to, say, synchronized swimming, this repetition motion through the water. Um, these are models we created in-house, so we're, we're putting together laser cut elements to start replicate what these, which turned out to be glue lamb, uh, whitewood timber beams, uh, linked by hidden nodal points, uh, how this would start to form. And this was an early render uh, where the, the school then, uh, I think, think it took them four years to get funding uh, to have the building uh, to build. The, uh, the pool was very limited in length, as I say, because that point there is literally the green belt. So it was kind of everything had to be really compressed um, and then pushing all the accommodation block back against the gym as, as tight as possible. But you've got eight meter wide pool by 16.6 .6 meters long, which is an Olympic module, but the shortest you can get. Um, you can start to see the articulation in plan, which will um, so actually talk, in, talk on the roof. So you've got 12 panels there, all identical but mirrored. And, uh, and the repetition was key to um, the production. Even though, Gordon, you said before about um, we can e easily have uh, changes in repetition, actually, because of the tight budgets on this, just to change one panel was all of the, it was more about the, um, the operative and engaging with the computer that would have massively increased the cost. But just by pressing mirror, there was no cost implication. So that was a key point in terms of how we developed the models. In elevation, um, we also created another distortion by creating a fold in the front of the gable, which then is, so in plan, it's, it's orthogonal, but at the uh, pool level, the inflection creates another distortion to the front face. So that's the kind of simple uh, method by which we, we created something that, that appears complex. Internally, we, didn't wanna, we wanted to kind of do away with the normal uh, utilitarian ductwork that you usually get, so really allowing the timber structure to sing, so very sort of clever mechanical arrangement um, sitting in this undercroft, so you don't see any ductwork in the, in the pool. The only thing you see is a number of hanging lights, and that's it in terms of M&E in the pool. Uh, just quickly through the construction, so pool's gone, foundation's going in. I'll get to some timber in a bit. Um, uh, this is the, the complex, so at this point we've got the, this quite tricky concrete arrangement to build and at the same time we've got, so at this point here, the whole way along, sorry, Cowley's been developing the timber frame with us, we've been, we've been exchanging computer models to kind of manipulate this form and get to a solution that we were, were both happy with, both in terms of our aesthetic and also one that works structurally and is, is, is constructed within the budget. So we had a, a large sample which sits in our office. Um, I think it's quite nice that the, the building's very much a narrative through model. So the model uh, very much becomes the end building. So we've got every scale of model down to this size, to this one in our office. So it's quite, it's quite a nice narrative. Um, amazing drawings done by Cowley. Um, I think working with Cowley was, 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 was great. Um, these are the wall panels. So again, the wall panel is a repetition, only one wall panel. Uh, these are the roof panels. So these are 15 meters long by three and a half meters wide. So it's the largest panel that you can get onto a lorry. I think these are amazing. These are the uh, galvanized uh, connector plates that sit within the, the timber. I mean, this on its own is kind of beautiful drawing. So the idea about not seeing anything on the, on the uh, external side. So these joints would be plugged. And then these were a, um, I think it's a Cowley's own uh, detail where they, they put a a tendon into the timber and it's resin fixed, so you don't see any fixings at all. This is uh, Cowley's workshop. Uh, these are the uh, 15 meter long uh, whitewood glue lamb beams. This is their CNC machine. Um, 
So these are the complex hidden junctions that accept the plates. I'll just fly through these, sorry. Um, these are the, uh, the, the tendons that go back into the timber to have these secret fixes because we've got eight or nine uh, timbers coming together, so there's not an opportunity to have uh, enough plates and fixings coming off of it. The fitting the plates. I like the fact that they're still using a saw on the left-hand side, even though you're doing all the CNC. Um, so this is the. Uh, so now you're starting to see the the glue line beams finish with a translucent white finish, which is about giving it some uh, protection within the swimming pool environment. But also on uh, in the foreground, this is the cross lamb timber. So this is a 22 mil jumbo plywood, but it matches the timber. So there's a kind of a, a, a homogeneous nature to all the timber. Um, you have to leave. You can't put the white paint on the joints, otherwise you won't fix it to the glue lamb. Uh, these are all the each of the sections within each panel uh, being painted. Assembling the, the frame, uh, again, I think, I think Peter notes how no one's doing anything in that image, but <laughs> <laughs> typical image. Um, so this is the bespoke trolley that they made for the 15 meter long panel. Um, this is them dropping on the, uh, the cross lamb onto the outside. So on site, there's the templating. So there's the slight worry that you've got this timber frame being built up um, in Lincolnshire, and this and the concrete being done in, uh, in Buckinghamshire. So this was trying to calibrate that. And within the joint, there's only a 50 mil either way. So I was slightly nervous. This is the first panels arriving, dropping into the pool, scaffolding around the outside with the building. Obviously, you can't but have scaffolding in the middle. Um, first panels coming, first panel going up. So the panel comes with a uh, the blue membrane. There is a, a vapor check barrier, uh, which is already installed on the panels. Uh, which affords it some protection once it's um, once it's erected. The process taking two weeks, but at that point having some um, moisture resistance, as it were. So first panel going up, panels coming in. This is fixing the panels, and at that point, you look back across the building and you start to see the correlation between the old gabled, the cream-coloured gables of the school and the uh, and the construction of the of of the pool. Using the same angle, you can start to see the correlation there. Um, so all the wall panels in place. So the first roof panel coming along, um, just coming in there. I think one tree had to be slightly moved to get this in. It was a, a tricky one. First panel going up. And at that point, we had the kind of the link and this starting to understand what this building was going to be. The end panel was too large to be uh, delivered, that had to be built on site, just too high in the width there, at five meters, um, without having to go for a, uh, a police escort. The roof panel's going on. And so this is a process over two weeks, at which point, um, I think that was the one misalignment they had on the joints, uh, which is, so this is zero, there's zero tolerance in anything. It was bang on, and I think that was the only spot where they had to re-drill one of the plates because it was just slightly off, which is quite amazing. So the idea of working at zero tolerance was, um, other than that, it seemed to be okay. Um, last panel going in. And at this point, you actually could walk inside the building very much how it was to be in the final building, which was quite interesting. Obviously, you had to get the crane out at the last second there. Fly through. So you start to see the complexity of these joints that we were working through in, um, in CAD. Um, all of these holes were to be plugged by, um, and then every plug aligned with a timber, which I thought was, was excellent. The grooves cut in for the lighting, all hidden um, concealments, um, the bolts. So there we've got the membrane on the outside. I'll fly through the last bit, but it's just the complexity of the cladding effectively having done be to be done by hand over what was a digital form, which was actually incredibly difficult. Um, so the complexity of how we clad it on timber on the outside without any fixings through the roof. So we used a special um, uh, offset bracketry developed to sit onto the standing seams, which you fix into, which is quite nice detail. Um, it's a calzit roof on the top. So this is the uh, battening going on. So this is mock-ups of the uh, external cladding and the complexity of how we're, the off different offsets through the different um, thicknesses of insulation, putting in pipe work, concealing all of this, having to create a different geometry to the outside was very was very tricky. So, pan and this actually, the cladding took about, I think, three or four months to go on. So, 
that's quite interesting to see the, the two weeks to four months of cladding. I think ideally we would have actually prefabricated the cladding panels, but obviously cost was a driver. Um, so there, you get a guy with a bit of string and he's going to run a skill saw across that joint. So that kind of... <laughs> so cladding's going on. Uh, putting up the frame to the front. So there you see the hidden downwater pipes coming from the uh, valley gutter. So it's all concealed with the downpipe coming into the inflection. Uh, and there's the finished building there, sitting with its context. Um, looking fairly similar to the original model. This is at night, with it lit up. A, a view, we managed to get on a crane and look back across for that view to show the kind of the link back to the school. This is, uh, it's Plato Fracay, Fracky. Um, wood, which is a, again thermally treated wood, I think you talked about Gordon, but it, we left it unfinished and it grays to an amazing gray within a few months. It's um, obviously you've got to be very careful about overlapping, so we avoided all trims. We worked with Trada to make sure that all the junctions uh, would, would would weather well um, and to avoid any different staining and patination on the building. This is down the back of the building, and. This is the children. Again, this is looking back at the utility block, so we kind of went for a much more pared back, raw, concrete, and we used, again, the exposed beam timbers, but kind of trying to save cost there. Changing rooms. A view. Luckily, we were able to do a, um, a level deck pool, which was actually, I mean, it really adds to the aesthetic, but it was actually a practical reason, because um, if you're trying to get a wheelchair user into a pool, a level deck is much better. So that, that worked quite well. That's the view back out into the green belt, the roof. And that was, we managed to take the office for a swim uh, a few months ago. So uh, we actually, because it, you do a building and you, it, without actually being in the pool, you don't actually experience the building. So we had to eventually get in there. And that's the last slide. Thank you. Questions for Philip? Yeah. Um, I was just interested, um, looking at the project, the Pompidou Centre, um, you had all of the beams were, were created from CNC milling out of large rectilinear pieces of timber. I was just interested to know, how, do you know how much wastage it was in doing that across the entire building? Because obviously well, I think there's the a lot point, of... Sorry, I think the whole point of their computer program was to actually limit that absolutely down. So they did a huge amount of research to limit wastage. So I think in the end it was quite efficient for a very inefficient form, let us call it. And w would there be any opportunity to bend those forms in the way that you did in some of your structures? Um, so I think, I think they, so that you they could would have been pressed to very close to the finished shape. OK. Uh, I know it looked very... Sorry. They, they, they look very challenging, but when you've sort of addressed it, you could probably form a jig. So um, an another way... Making the jigs probably cost more than <laughs> the... Right, OK. Depending on what kit they've got, I don't know. OK. I was just inquisitive to know how the children reacted to going into the pool for the first time. So the, uh, the pool was finished um, one day before the end of term last year. And uh, they managed to get every single pupil from the school into the swimming pool on that day. And, uh, and yeah, the, and the children love it. I mean, I should have said, the, um, as I said before, it's uh, for a, for a state-run school. And the big part of the brief was to open it up to the community. So they actually have community groups in there pretty much every day, and I think they think that the, the, the budget, the final cost was at 1.8 million, and it's going to be, they will have paid it off within two years, they think, through bringing in the community, mothers and baby groups. Uh, there isn't any swimming pools in the local area, so the kind of reception to it is, uh, is, is, is quite, it's quite amazing.